Hardcore, some of them talk, but lacking in character. How can I relax when this theft the innocence? The harmless are broken. Oh, what tragedy to meet death with the lost word unspoken. Hide it behind the foundations, charity constructed. House of euthanasia, architects, and house of cards remain hidden behind one noble cause. Extravagant facade, masquerading as God. I don't buy it at all. I like the real thing raw. I tell the whole veil off. The lights on the off. I get money the way the stellar man in effect. I leave you free and breathless like true psychedelic acceptance. Real view becomes transcendent. This midnight smoke is so high octane, paralyzing. Hello everyone, welcome to This Week in Tyranny, the most hardcore news show on earth. I am your host, Conrad Bogus. Today is Friday, November 10th, 2023. This is episode 49 of This Week in Tyranny. We're coming to you from Odyssey, BitChute, who knows, maybe some other platforms, but definitely not YouTube, because I've gotten a strike for, for my last video. It's kind of a funny story that I won't get into, but here we go. Um, the good thing is I'll be... I'll really be able to say things the way I want to say them. So this week, I'm really tired of talking about Israel and Hamas. It's just the reality of it. It's the main story. It continues to dominate the news. But I'm really tired of talking about it. Everyone is talking about it. So we're going to get a step ahead of the tyranny. We're not going to ignore it. I will talk about that, the things that are going on, and the other things that are going on that may not be, that definitely aren't in the national news. So for this week, it's it's kind of a presentation in itself. And the presentation that it would be, would I be doing it, is second wave neo-Nazism, a post-pandemic reshuffling of the dissatisfied American public. So what am I talking about with this second wave neo-Nazism? It's kind of a term I coin. It is a thing that you're going to see more of. You're going to see more of this far-right nationalistic American movement. And... Uh, what is it? It's a controlled opposition response to advancing globalism in the 21st century. So, I'm talking about controlled opposition, and this is what's this is what's coming. I'm seeing this already. When you look at your your neighbors, you look at the people uh, you know, you should be able to see this. You've got kind of a sentiment brewing, a um, uh, nationalistic racial sentiment. So I'm going to get into that deeply. But, but there's a phenom phenomenon where the developing white nationalism is gaining steam in the background among the people, mainly the working class. Because the working class has been has been getting it. They've been they've been really bearing the brunt of all these super liberal globalist ideologies, right? That uh, their their methods and their actions taken. So uh, he here's what happens. Anyone who opposes the intensifying you know international socialism all the crazy stuff the environmental carbon zero anyone who opposes you know the forced vaccination anyone who opposes the the geoengineering and all this crazy stuff that they're doing their extremist agendas as far as you know transgenderism and uh, really sexualizing education in schools all of these things that they're pushing anyone who is against that which is any person with some sense is going to get funneled into a brewing right-wing ideology. So I'm talking about this little counter, this push, this counter attack, this counter culture. It's not really, it's it's just, it's not really beginning to flower yet. That's why I'm getting, we're getting a step ahead of the tyranny. But this is happening and it's a, it's a dangerous thing because they're setting up two collectivist ideologies um, opposing against each other. And people don't realize that this is what they're going to get caught in. So this right-wing ideology is going to promise a return to former prosperity, common sense, traditional values. You know, this is kind of what Trump was kind of symbolizing to the people. That's what he was symbolizing. Uh, same thing with DeSantis. It's, it's kind of the thing. Even when you uh, listen to Alex Jones now, he never used to be this Christian pro-America, pro-military guy. But this is this is where 
the conservatives who are breaking away from, from the status quo are kind of getting pushed into this, funneled into this. And now some of the people who are just disgruntled or they want freedom or they're just tired of, you know, their currency, their, their nation being destroyed, their currency being inflated. They're getting funneled into this traditional values, common sense type of thing. But there's a real danger of this becoming a far right type of thing. And this is what this is about. Um, it will be associated with economic prosperity, a strong uniform culture, and a return to traditional family values. But what it will actually do is bolster the military and police, right? And it's going to centralize government power, even in the sense of a single leader having more power. And you've seen this in some of the European parties. This is not just an American phenomenon, even though I'm going to focus on the United States. You've seen this in some of the parties around the world where the central leader who is saying what the world is doing, the globalists are selling us out. We need to come together as a country, whether it's Brazil or, or, or Germany or whatever. That leader, that central leader, he's really acting more as a, of like a king, like, uh, like a de facto ruler, right? Uh, and this is what what is going to happen. It's an old plan. This is not this is not anything new. This is how it's gone throughout history. Uh, this is like the person that gathers a nation that's on its knees to fight back against the enemies. But as they're fighting back against the enemies, it actually becomes the slavery system of collectivism, another authoritarian patriarchal system. And that actually kind of what I said before about bolstering military and police and centralizing government power that actually pretty well describes the trump presidency now i'm not going to get into any trump bashing right because i'm totally aware of how the mainstream media has painted him as as hitler they they've said he's like adolf hitler they've said his followers are nazis and they've said his policies are fascist when in reality if you look at just the person and, and the candidate and the president he he is far from it He's nothing like uh, like Nazi, but this is what has happened. It, it's become this real like buddy-buddy relationship with the military and police, right? All of a sudden, they're the good guys. Um, you know, government corruption is kind of getting put to the back burner and centralizing government power, which is what happened. So... In reality, he's far from that, right? I'm not saying Trump is going to be this guy, but it's the symbol. It's what he's symbolizing. But still, past the symbols, there are some parallels that I would draw attention to and sound the alarm about the, the white nationalist sentiment that will be increasing in America. This is, gonna, this is going to happen. Now, the mainstream media will say that if you're against globalism, surveillance, uh, and, uh, and you're for family values, then you're either a Nazi or a white nationalist, and no, that is not the case, right? That, that's not the case. That's not what I'm saying here. Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm not a liberal either. But that Nazi sentiment is growing in this nation. It's definitely growing. And there are these ultra-right wing movements springing up around the world, which I've mentioned. You know, someone actually brought it to my attention in Chicago, where I live, there are these guys with banners over the highway at least it happened at least once but it's happening more they had a banner and and some of the markings i really had to investigate what they were saying it was kind of a benign statement but they're a white they're, they're um aryan group right it had it had the roman numerals 14 and uh, 1488 the 14 words this is a um, aryan aryan uh, neo-nazi type of group statement right they got uh, fp plates you know the rental cars and, and the, the post was actually removed on reddit i would put the image up but it was actually removed um that's my fault uh, you know that's a journalistic slip up for not i didn't know that information would would come up to be important because i thought oh another neo-nazi movement this is kind of happening lately i've been seeing this coming for, for like for a while if you're paying attention I think many of, of the listeners see this, right? Know what I mean is that there, there seems to be this growing sentiment. It's very, it's very simply nationalistic. It's supposed to be pro freedom, but it turns to be really just another authoritarian type of type of thought. So, 
since we mentioned Donald Trump and everything, um, let's talk about some of those parallels. You know, the, the January 6th insurrection. They call it an insurrection. I mean, they went into a building, they took some pictures, right? Essentially, this, this is a joke, right? Um, the political double standard is, is obvious. And this is one of the things that makes it easy to fall into this ultra-right sentiment. Because the, clearly, the media and the government is is persecuting one side, and, and there's a complete double standard, right? So, so it's it's easy to see how people can fall into that kind of dualistic thinking that you're going to take the side of the current underdogs. Right now, hey, the the pro-white people, the the pro-Christian people, the the patriotic people, they are the underdogs here, right? So it's it's quite easy to take their side uh, but but that insurrection that january 6th riot and donald trump's ongoing trials he's in court as we speak it's actually very similar to adolf hitler's rise to power so i'll talk a little bit about that um, one of the events on Hit adolf hitler's rise to power this is really how he came to prominence this is his big thing um it actually happened on the night of november 9th 1923 so today is november 10th this is uh, the hundred year anniversary how fitting right uh, on that night hitler and the nazi party back then remember they they weren't in power yet but hitler and the nazi party attempted a coup d'etat in munich meaning overthrowing the state <laughs> what they say that donald trump and and those people tried to do uh hitler and the nazis they actually tried to do they went there with guns they they had you know they were well armed they he had a paramilitary group at the time this is germany between world war one and world war two it was this is what it was like it was kind of the wild west uh, and this was called the beer hall putsch right the beer hall putsch is, is this coup d'etat that, that he tried to do he tried to overthrow the government at the time at, at the city center they marched on the city center but they were stopped by police and they had a battle they had a standoff and they had a shootout that killed several people right but uh, Adolf Hitler actually escaped that, but he was arrested two days later. Two days later, actually, on 11-11. So, uh, for those who know about the, you know, th there's a lot of symbolism to this. Of course, 11-11, and, and they charged him with treason, just like the Capitol rioters. I mean, this is what happens. You try to overthrow the government, they'll charge you with treason. Except on January 6th, the... They charged the people with treason, but what they were actually trying to do is kind of more of like a political stunt to bring up the the elections. Oh, I can finally say it here. Bring up the damn election that they took down my first episode on YouTube for. But hey, it's only right. It's only right that it works out that way. Yeah. Election fraud. I'll talk more about election fraud and how that actually, that loss of confidence in, um, in government infrastructure loss of faith in elections actually makes people more prone to fall into these neo-nazi ideologies because when you lose faith in the outcome of elections on both sides and they lose faith in them when they're doing the damn thing when they're doing all these things uh, and that's operating under the assumption that the election is legitimate in the first place which is but the point is when you don't trust that outcome you're going to be more prone to put your support behind that leader that's going to act more like a dictator and a king to come to power because he's going to promise you a pro you future right don't want to get ahead of myself i'll talk about all this so they get charged with treason uh, he was placed on trial adolf hitler after this he was placed on trial and sentenced to five years so he was supposed to go away for five years which and that actually during the trial it gave him a public platform they publicized it so it gave him a platform to spread his ideas which he did at the time and then he went away for five years now this is much different from trump obviously after this hitler came to power actually right like this is before his rise to power now trump he probably doesn't have five years trump's pretty old um but it's not the point is not that he will be this coming neo-nazi dictator i highly doubt that but this general game plan is tried and tested in the history of uh you know in history of radicalizing a disillusioned population that's what it is so whether it's trump or somebody else 
this idea of having this guy and then having the uh, what they're calling is a attempted overthrow then they imprison him they punish him they they martyr him as the society continues to decline that creates sympathy for the ideas associated with trump which at this point are not his actual policies the ideas associated with trump are get rid of the immigrants have a strong military have a strong police and say no to to globalism on the surface right um so but you know what he he actually didn't do five years adolf hitler he came out after nine months right um so so keep that in mind this is not impossible nobody knows what's going to happen in the next election or what's going to happen in the next few years don't be surprised if a radical thing like that happens it could happen from the other side this is the thing about getting ahead right seeing the full picture so radicalizing a disillusioned population and then getting it to align with an authoritarian regime vladimir lenin was also imprisoned and exiled right and and there was an actual speaking of there was an international uh, conspiracy to actually bring Lenin from his exile back to Russia where he could have the communist uh, revolution essentially um, that happened so I know that people think that these guys the, the, these conservative candidates are outside of the power structure in some way but don't be surprised if it comes back as this kind of a nationalistic leader so like I said, everyone's looking to the WEF or the Biden administration or the banks for, for the anticipated huge conflict and disaster in America. Everyone's anticipating a, a, a big crash, which, which makes sense. Um, the only direction the society is going right now is, is down. So this anticipated event, it makes sense. But like I said, don't be surprised if that move comes from the other side of the chessboard because that option is on the table. That's how the dark cult works. You got both options on the table. You know, uh, that's how social engineering works. The psychology of global enslavement is ready for either a maternal or a paternal tyranny. The last 300 years have shown that the chosen form of, of governance for the new slavery system is going to be maternal. Meaning what? Meaning international socialism. Meaning controlling people through social and, and economic uh, influence. Um, it, it's through giving them it's through evening out the money supply but if the people become really stubborn and inobstinate and they resist that and they they l just look out for that paternal fatherland type of homeland national socialism because that can happen that is accessible to them that 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 is that's why you see these ideologies they're kind of brewing so, so we, they can go in any direction to quickly transform this nation to being totally separated from the original ideas of the Declaration of Independence, from the original ideas that are about owning property and not allowing anybody to take it for any reason, not allowing anybody to force you to, to sacrifice for the greater good for any reason. We can really split from those very fast uh, if we're not careful. We have to oppose both of these to have freedom both the the paternal the fatherly and the maternal the the motherly tyranny that that has been there th throughout the history of the world uh, communism and nazism is a perfect example that's why you got mother russia and that's why you had the fatherland uh, the deutschland it's you know it really is that simple now on one hand, the January 6th prisoners are the ones who are currently being treated like Nazi prisoners. You know, the guys who stormed the Capitol on the 6th, um, there are reports coming out that they're not being fed, that, that they're being tortured. Um, and I would I would say that those reports sound like they, they're accurate. It may, I haven't investigated them. Like, how are you really going to verify them? But I believe those people and I think they are being treated like that um, so so that's not to say that this kind of Nazi reaction is going to be the one causing all this violence right the actual violence 
we'll still be on the side of the government, which in my view is going to continue to be international socialism. It's going to continue to be leftist, right? But that doesn't mean that that rebirth of Nazi sentiment is not relevant. It's not that it will work as a powerful regime, but inside the minds of the people, it will be powerful. And that's why the upcoming controlled opposition, right, the, the opposition to globalism will fall, it will fail if it takes on this ideology. Because a people with a slave ideology can never break free. Nazism is a slave ideology for a slave culture. But the violent action is going to remain on the authoritarian establishment left. And here you got the mistreatment and torture of, of political prisoners. Uh, of course, um, really we've had the mistreatment and torture of, of, of prisoners. It's just that now, really the, the reality is these guys that stormed the capital, they're being treated the way um, black people, black men in America have been treated for, for you know, the last hundred years and more, but as the last hundred years in, in the prison system. Uh, that doesn't mean it's right. It's just, yeah, this is this is how the government does business. And it's just coming to the forefront now because these are people who used to be Green Berets and they used to be in the military. And now they're being treated like, like they're in Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, that, that's what happens. And that radicalizes both sides. This is why I make an episode like this because violence radicalizes both sides. And usually it becomes violence against violence and almost all wars and conflicts we can think of none of them are, are actually a just war none of them are freedom against slavery none of them are righteousness against violence that that battle is usually in the mind and this is why we need to return to the ideal to the ideals of individuality integrity honesty individual property morality natural law these are the things that are going to uh, actually transform our society and not any kind of far or left far left or far right ideology so let me real quick talk about the characteristics of nazism We're, i'm transitioning to the next point here um so i'm going to give i'm going to rattle them off and i'm going to compare them with what's going on with this kind of new brewing sentiment the the kind of thinking that's becoming common among americans you got racial pride or racial purity first this racial pride and purity thing is is really starting to gain steam this is what what a lot of people think uh this is what this is how it is in rural america i'm sure so and, and i know I, I go out to you know wisconsin or, or i know how it is are out of the city even though i i live in the city uh, and that's not to say that kind of racial pride mentality hasn't been there before but now that it's coming to the forefront and these ideas are being spread and these ideas are okay to express because the pressure fr from the globalist uh, media and, and and government is so immense that now these ideas people are free to express them because what else are you going to do they're infringing on our way of life so much the food prices are going up all this stuff the uh, the laws that are being passed are so detached from reality that the people don't know where to turn to so they're going to turn to these extremist ideologies because it makes the most sense to them so step one racial pride and then included in that you got blaming the migrants blaming the immigrants uh, this is classic right so pointing out the foreign aid obviously uh, the united states giving all this aid to to ukraine and to israel then the housing of refugees right refugees migrants the migrant crisis and then driving down wages uh, we've heard all of this before right you probably could have turned on a talk radio station from from the 80s they would have talked about the same thing um uh, but, but this is one of the ideas uh, but so not this is really becoming like a racial thing like a pro-white thing right because uh, it's all these foreigners taking what's ours it's a very simple way to think but this is what it's been uh, and also the idea of purity in a gender sense you know the the skirt wearing housewife has never been more in demand so if you're paying attention to 
you know, on YouTube, on Shorts, on TikTok, you're seeing this this traditional wife type of trend. And I get it, you know. Obviously, I get the appeal of that, especially when we've been getting bombarded with really unappealing and and these kind of toxic images of of of, of women. And really, we miss the actual feminine, like real woman. So we go to, you know, to the past, to our parents, to our grandparents' generation to look for, okay, where can I find a woman? This is what men think. Like, what archetype, what type of symbol will I find her with? And it is the traditional housewife that's going to just do her job and not really be actualized or self-realized at all. She's just, she's going to be happy with her role of, of just being basically a, a mother and and um and a wife which is not a bad thing right i'm not trying to denigrate that at all but the problem is that for that simple pleasure and fulfillment to just be the man of the house and have a traditional wife the men are gonna go along with the worldview that aligns itself to that image right it's about the image uh, meaning they will not be a warrior they will not be a true fighter for freedom there's going to be somebody that supports the leader because he's going to promise them that you'll get your piece of the land and the immigrants won't take it from you and then you'll have your woman and she will not be able to really have an opinion of her own if it goes against basically the opinion of of us of the race or the nation and that's what it really is this is a return to the old way of life which was like this which is the man of the house being an authoritarian figure right the the head of the household which which i get which which there is you know i agree with that but this is a, a tyrannical element already between between the wife and the husband uh, and this is going back this is going back in ideas this is going before the ideas of the american revolution or the ideas of uh you know of the of the enlightenment or really the the renaissance of just being free this is not about being free this is there other people are taking what's mine they're crusading they're taking my society uh, whoever drives them out i'm going to support him so i could have mine that's how you get into slavery and speaking of women uh, another aspect of this new brewing Nazi, neo-Nazi, second wave neo-Nazism is controlling the female's body. So I'm talking about abortion and reproductive health. Man, good thing this this one isn't on YouTube, right? It will be taken down for sure. So, yeah, I, um, abortion is, is a controversial one, obviously. So, yes, I know the death of a fetus or an infant or a baby is horrific and crushingly sad really right so so am i about to go support abortion that's not what i'm saying but at the end of the day the the mother has to carry the baby to term and she has to fully dedicate herself to the baby for at least several months after birth right so she has to do that of her free will and if she doesn't want to do that then then you can't make her right and, and if that's what she decides then it's it's the, blo the blood's on her hands if she does right but if you use the government to stop her then you have the blood on your hands for doing business with thieves and murders which is what government is so i've seen all of the stuff going on in the little in the individual state elections um the laws being argued about abortion rights right we've had the overturn of roe versus wade recently uh, and this kind of intensifying of the abortion issue, this is all part of it. This is part of this neo-Nazism that's brewing. Um, because they've been calling it a medical procedure for the last, what, 60 years? And all of a sudden, it's it's going to be spoken of as immoral, like in a very religious sense. Immoral, you know, and, and yes, it is immoral, yes. But this is the thing now you got wrongdoing on both sides because it's not so much as wrongdoing but but you've got trauma on on both sides is the point that now you're really telling the woman what to do with her body i know it's not just i know it's not just her body 
but you've been telling her that it is, right? So now it's coming at it from a very religious perspective. The, the pro-life thing has always been religious when, to me, it should have never even gone that far because you don't need a, a specific religion to understand that the taking of, of human life and destruction of a baby is wrong. Just in nature, just in a rational sense. Like, where's where's logic in this? Where's rationality in this? And this is, the, this is the problem of the Hegelian dialectic, is that these two sides are both wrong. They're both wrong. But the point is, using government to get it get to get in the woman's body and tell her what to do this is a char characteristic of nazism or ultra right-wing ideologies and along those lines you got the sentiment of not celebrating a woman's sexuality anymore this is kind of the counter attack you, you see the theme of like a counter like a counter like a pushback it's a pushback to everything all the playboy magazines and all the porn and all the showing everything about a woman that we've been doing for the last what you know another what are we talking about 50 years 40 years uh, all this sexual liberation and now there's kind of a disillusionment of that there's a, like a numbness and and a, uh, you know the allure of that has really gone away so now you've got the pushback you've got um, the, the no no fap thing about people really cutting doing away with porn uh, cutting their porn addictions which is good right that's a good thing right the the porn thing has, is definitely poisoning males but this is also going to poison males because you're going to start becoming ashamed of your sexuality and you're not going to have an outlet for those urges um, the way you need to deal with that as a man is to be driven towards a singular purpose and really elevate yourself and then you will not feel so ashamed about your desires and you will be more able to release those desires in a more constructive way uh, you're going to see women actually appreciate you more even if you you don't even know how that works it's going to work if you're doing what you need to do as a man working toward a purpose right working to develop yourself these kind of things aren't aren't going to be such a tyrant in your life so this anti-porn movement everything about semen retention and all this this is about not celebrating a woman's sexuality anymore so it's about purity but really the purity is suppression it's about sexual suppression and repression and if you go look at the nazis go look at the picture of the nazis at the time you could see they're all l lost little boys who are sexually repressed and this is why they, they got the big tanks and everything and this is why they wanted to, they, they had these, you know, these, I'll talk about the esoteric Nazism, but they were trying to be God men. And they were talking about this Aryan race, this genetic memory, this glory of the ancestors. This is what it comes from. It comes from sexual repression. And along with that, um, one of the characteristics is a, a, of this second wave neo-Nazism is a return to traditional religion. Now, of course, it's not a bad thing, like religion is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to think about the designer and creator of the universe and therefore think about morality. But religion is really the suppression of human expression. It's about, it's about the toning down and handcuffing and shackling of human expression. And that's how it's been throughout history. So everything, you know, America is supposed to be pro-Christian, a Christian nation. Well, you know, remember, liberation is, is what made this nation. Um, yes, a, a, a Christian backbone as far as the morality that, that's put forth in, in the New Testament, really. But when you see this return to religion now, it's going to be about suppression. So yes, I know the church has been attacked. I know the church has been attacked. On one hand, the church is obviously guilty of, of pedophilia and all kinds of sicknesses. And really, the church is lineally responsible for, for the destruction of, of the male relations between a man and a woman. The whole thing with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is the most bullshit story ever. And I'm sorry for, you know, 
the, the point is, what I'm getting at with, with Adam and Eve is that the whole idea of original sin and seeing the woman as tainted and sinful is, is by making you ashamed of yourself for desiring the woman, uh, then putting all of that frustration and resentment on her that she is somehow sinful or dirty for, for being a sexual creature. And then that's making you ashamed. And really, this is mental eugenics. This is extermination. This is what they tell the slaves. Uh, and this is why the Adam and Eve story is bullshit and it's toxic as hell. It's the stupidest goddamn thing I've ever heard. And I always tell people, yes, uh, I like the Adam and Eve story. And, but, but the real problem with original sin, the real original sin was Adam's weakness and softness and his moral relativism. So if you're, if you're a true man, if you're a, a true upright man, um, as Christ was, aspiring to be that then you put the blame on yourself in what you're doing and not what the woman is doing um, and that's a good cure to this brewing neo-nazism another thing you've got a strong military and a authoritative domineering masculine presence uh, this one's obvious you know this is kind of uh, this is the thing associated with trump uh, remasculinizing the military because obviously we know that the military has been, it's been, uh, it's not been so masculine as as of late in America, right? So, so that idea of being a strong nation again, a proud nation, like that pride is, is one of the things, and with that comes along being anti-LGBT, and that's really a longer topic. I've done videos about that, but I'm really going to try to hurry this up. This is a long video already. Another aspect is, this the main one, is racial eugenics. This is the aspect of neo-Nazism. This is an aspect of, of Hitlerian Nazism, right? That, of course, they were about having the Aryan race dominate the world and to exterminate everybody who was inferior. Now, in the second wave neo-Nazism, meaning what we have brewing in America, we don't have this yet, but the Great Replacement it conveys this narrative through the negative so it's implied so it's it's not that the white people should exterminate the others because they are inferior but this is the sentiment that the white race is being attacked and being targeted by genocide and being exterminated for its superiority so the same message is, is passed on now is there a, a eugenics campaign and extermination against um, against uh, the white people yes there is this is going on we, we are being targeted but it's not for our race it's for our ideas it's for our virtues this is the thing it's not race it's not race it's the virtues and the ideas and you should be spreading the virtues and the ideas and not the racial dogma not the religious dogma but as you can see it's very difficult to get that across to people so those are some of the characteristics and and if you go back and listen to those you'll see that this is a very very close very closely aligned now i'm gonna retouch with with israel uh, because really this is what inspired this episode is actually israel because israel parallels with nazism quite well one-to-one -one. We think Israel is the opposite of Adolf Hitler, right, and Nazi Germany, because obviously Israel is the Jews, and Hitler killed the Jews, so they have to be opposites, right? But they're not. The way the state of Israel operates today and behaves is actually very similar to Nazism. So I'll talk about some of the doctrines. One one is your, your whole thing about ancestral land, your thing about holy land, which is the whole premise that Israel was, was built on. That is the premise that the whole land is built on. Um, you know, the people that were not living in, in the land that is called Israel today were brought there because they have a religious claim to the land, that it was the land of their ancestors. Well, that's actually the same claim that the Nazis made. It's the esoteric Nazism, which is, um, let me get a drink. Oh, 
don't let me get angry here. I'm going to run out of water. Nazis make me pretty angry. So uh, this has actually been pretty tame so far. So continuing with what I was saying, it's the whole thing about ancestral land. And with the Nazis, it was Hyperborea. The ancient, um, not ancient, but the, the historical Aryan doctrine is that the Aryan people traced their lineage back to Atlantis. And it was the, the white, tall, northern European men, uh, the, the northern cultures that were basically, uh, that spread their ideas through the whole world in Hyperborea, the land of Atlantis. And um, and this is, I'll return to that, but I wanted just to say that first. Now, let me go to the next point. The next point is obviously you've got extermination, you've got genocide, you've got ethnic cleansing. This is what Israel is doing. I've seen so many images of, of, of really children uh, that are in the hospital after bomb strikes that stuff is surreal like that's rough that really like that really gets to you um people don't understand this but there is no the war with hamas is it's not a normal war like this it's not two military forces fighting against each other israel is bombing villages it's bombing hospitals it's bombing places where w women and children are and that is the strategy of war so so it's not actually war it's ethnic cleansing it's just the Holocaust all over again in the Gaza Strip. It is a continuing Holocaust, but people don't understand that because it's done by Israel. And the irony is so wild. But yes, the people that are historically persecuted, they're supposed to be in Israel now, but, but it has nothing to do with it. Uh, the state of Israel, the government of Israel, right now is doing a nazi extermination on at least the gaza strip okay i'm not even talking about the west bank obviously there's that too there's settler violence there too but if you just stick to the gaza strip can somebody explain to me how you justify bombing these children and you gotta just really go through the videos with me to like really feel that because i think a lot of people are talking and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about they're talking in abstractions okay and generalities i'm talking about facts i'm talking about 10,000 dead palestinians over 4,000 of those uh, are women and uh, over 3,000 are children or um i don't know if i got those mixed up but you've got 67 percent of deaths in gaza are of women and children and that's according to the un and unicef funny thing about that is uh, the American politicians, or the American uh, administration, Biden administration, is trying to throw those numbers into question, saying they have no confidence in those figures. But then the UN and UNICEF stood behind that, and their estimates have been uh, accurate historically. Not that I trust the UN and UNICEF, but let's keep it real here. You could see they're killing these these women and children, and they're they're just straight up bombing the whole area. Uh, that strategy is called mowing the grass and they actually call it this people don't know this because they don't go out and listen to the israeli leaders the israeli officials they talk about this openly that they're mowing the grass that this is their strategy of war that they're going to kill all these women and children as a means of flushing the terrorists out right they treat them the same it's a massacre um you know, this is just the reality. Zionism is Nazism. People don't get that. Um, another thing about Israel and, and the way they act like Nazis, they have the Hannibal Directive, which is basically a policy that if somebody takes a hostage, an Israeli hostage, they don't negotiate to get the hostage back. You may have seen that in the media. That's an isolated incident. But the directive is to, to just to kill, actually to go out and specifically kill the Israeli hostages, their own people, bomb everybody so that they can't be used against them. Uh, it's total war over there. People don't realize how how Israel works as, as a military force. Um, and people just refuse to acknowledge, you know, that's why I really needed to make this episode because the two that I've done, uh, really three, 
that I've done about Israel and, and Palestine. It's been kind of objective. It's been breaking down the history. It's been breaking down both sides. Now, you know, I really had to acknowledge the, the reality as it's developing in front of my eyes of what they're really doing over there. I mean, people just don't want to go, don't want to go look at it. Just because they have a blue star on their flag, they 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 think it's something else. The reality is, um, it's extermination over there. Um, I'll I'll just go on. I'll continue. There are parallels with um, with what Israel does in the Gaza Strip. This is what I was getting to. I, I thought I was forgetting something, but I'll talk about it here. So, the treatment of, of how the Israel military works in, in a very Nazi way. This is the new... Um, there, there is an alignment with Israel and the United States. Now, they're, they're allies. But especially them two, even more so than Europe. You see, this isn't just like a Western alliance. It's more so the Europe, uh, European nations talking about a humanitarian... You know, right now there's supposed to be a humanitarian pause. So they, they'll they stop every day. They'll stop bombing Gaza for four hours. And that's supposed to be some type of act of benevolence. So they'll stop bombing them for four hours where they can, like, give them food and aid and then continue to bomb them, to bomb women and children. And, um, you know, European nations are calling for, for a ceasefire, but the United States and Israel are, as they always have been, Israel has rightfully been always called the 51st state. Uh, they've been very supportive. And there's a reason it's America specifically. And that's why I go in to talk about Israel. Because they're, they're aligning ideologically. Because this is the ideology that's arising. The same way Israel views the Arabs is the way they want the opposition, the controlled opposition in America, to view the rest of the world. Because this is how they're going to overthrow the American ideals uh, of private property, right, of self-defense, this is how they're going to overthrow it. They've, they're already doing it to the children through the schools and, and through social media and everything. The international socialism and now to the older population and the population that's rejecting that, they're going to get in with national socialism and they're going to crush America from within with these Nazi ideologies these neo-Nazi ideologies that are purportedly supposed to save them f from the big beast, but it's really part of the big beast, okay? It's part of the enemy. This is part of the great destroyer of of the world that is going to plunge the world into the slavery that we have seen in, in human history in the Dark Ages and past. The Dark Ages are coming back. That's all it is. Now, the treatment of... Uh, of um, Palestinians by Israel is very similar to the treatment in the Warsaw Ghetto by the Nazis in the 1940s. Uh, I'm talking about Poland, right? I'm Polish, so when I look at I look at what they're doing in the Gaza Strip, it's just like the Warsaw Ghetto, and that no wonder it's an occupation. This is an occupation. So let me talk about those parallels. The inhabitants were called terrorists. This is what they called regular people. Like if I was born, if I was a young person, uh, you know, in the Warsaw Ghetto, I would be called a terrorist. What would I be doing? I would be fighting the occupation, clearly, right? But e even if I was just, you know, learning the language, just, just going to school, you're called a terrorist um, by default. That's how it goes in the occupation. Now, for the actual resistance members, if you are a known resistance member, uh, engaged in, in like guerrilla warfare or even just normal disobedience to the Nazi occupation in the 1940s in in like Warsaw in in the Warsaw ghetto the treatment was if they found out that's what you were doing your entire building where you lived was fair game to be shot or burned down which they actually did with flamethrowers or or bomb that they, they would blow up the whole building if you were in there that's how it goes under occupation and, and a Nazi occupation specifically. It's not a normal occupation. It's a Nazi occupation where they're not just viewing you as an enemy. They're viewing you as vermin to be exterminated. And that's how it went. 
Now, if somebody's housing a resistance member or the, or housing a, a, a Jew at the time, the whole family, everybody it, it, it would be shot. They take the women and children onto the street. They just shoot them. They leave them in the street. And that's what they do in the Gaza Strip, actually. Except now they do it long range through through bombing. But you also have executions in Israel. Indiscriminate executions of civilians. Uh, this actually happened after the... Um, one, one of the operations on my birthday, February 2nd, it was one of the worst, but one of the last public executions in Warsaw. They shoot like 300 people in the street as like revenge for killing one Nazi officer, which was a, which was a, a beautiful operation that the Polish resistance did. Uh, they they got the main they got but basically like the main tyrant that was um, operating in in the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, so uh, that that's what happened. And then you got indiscriminate executions of civilians, which is what they're doing in the Gaza Strip. Now this is what a Nazi occupation looks like, except now it's not the swastika on the flag. It's not a red swastika or a black swastika. It's a blue Star of David, but the treatment is the same. Now, uh, this neo-Nazi ideology is becoming popular mostly among the working class. Now, um, a racist working class makes this kind of, I shouldn't say racist, but this ideology along the working class, it creates class division. And class division allows authoritarianism to flourish. Because if the working class has one ideology while the middle class has another, uh, you get authoritarianism because the high, the upper class is going to align with government to protect their property from the lower classes, right? So you got social class friction, um, uh, and this is another parallel with Poland because in Poland now the communism did not fall um, the way the the whole movement was in Poland to drive communism out of Poland it was actually civil disobedience it started with the students protesting right now they were crushed they didn't have enough power the the students started protesting and and all this stuff they were beaten and killed obviously uh, this is like the the 80s and this is like the 80s now you know communist occupation in its last years that didn't work and then the miners actually the workers also went on strike after that it was with strikes basically that this happened uh, they they rebelled uh, but and they were also obviously crushed and suppressed and it was not until they joined forces they joined forces and then they were actually that solidarity movement they were actually able to to destroy the power of of the soviet union it was already a weakened soviet union internationally but this is how they did it it was a unification of the upper class and the lower class and and, and this is this is how it has to go uh, some sort of intellectual class or you know the intellectuals have to join with the muscle with the with the muscle with the working class engine of the country right the, this is how it actually works so so keep that in mind as you, as we think about this right and and what what the ideologies are of the working class and the middle class so let me switch gears and now talk about the historical basis for this right the, the basis for that i called it esoteric nazism this ancient doctrine that made people believe that that you know that Adolf Hitler was going to basically bring bring Germany to its former glory and bring the Aryan people back to its former glory right you got you got this history of a central Aryan race being at the root of human achievement and essentially them being the lineal pro progenitor of Judeo-Christian Western culture now that's esoteric Nazism and really it's, it's before even Nazism but there's all this historical work about an Aryan race, a, a higher race that is called Aryan or the Hyperborean race, and them being basically like the, the a bit of a secret society of human society, and and they were the ones they were the most moral, they were the most pure, and they brought 
all the advancements to all of the world, uh, tracing their lineage back to even you know S Sumeria. Now, this ancient narrative about a Hyperborean race, ancestor worship, and reactivating the genetic memory of the race can easily be grabbed onto as the intellectual and historical basis for an ideology for a race-based nationalist movement. The reason I bring that up, I hope everybody's following me, is that this is how you get that middle class or, or the educated people to latch on to what the working class people already believe in their hearts, which is what they believe that these immigrants are taking our jobs, these guys are, are trying to, you know, that they're messing, the, the politicians are corrupt, everything is messed up, and we need to go back to how America used to be. Now, that's the working class that believes that. Now, that will not be an effective movement until the, unless there is some type of a middle class support or upper class support. And this is how, how it happened in Nazi Germany. There was the poor Germans who were basically destroyed after World War I, but then also you had this intellectual elite, so-called, that believed this Hyperborean Aryan doctrine. And that's how, how it actually became a powerful movement. So, but as far as the historical validity, it, it would be foolish for me to dismiss the validity of that history. You know, from Sumeria to the Eastern civilizations down through Europe in the last 2,000 years. There's so much research about that stuff that... You know i'm not that well researched in and it would take too long so i'm not really gonna i'm not saying that the whole thing is wrong even i'm not saying that there's no validity to the uh, aryan uh, history that that you know that is being brought up more now but the re-emergence and re-popularization re of this knowledge this will be the bridge of uniting the intellectual portion with the working class portion of this movement should it flourish right i don't know if it's going to go this way but i'm just warning people it seems like this is where it's going and it's on the table so if we resist globalism like left-wing globalism communism if we resist it hard enough this will, will become the new plan this will become the enemy and if you don't know the enemy the people are going to fall for it because they're ready already the people will, are, are so close to jumping to this completely. The disgruntled working class in rural white America is worlds apart from this esoteric historical investigation of this purported racial prowess as of now, right? But it will be, it will be there as this movement's philosophical base. Well, that's going to be there if it becomes a powerful movement it's going to need to have some sort of coherent basis in logic and history and this will be it so look into that hyperborean aryan doctrine and esoteric nazism because it's coming back but the reality is racial memory and genetic ancestry is bullshit it, they're, they're bullshit concepts the aryans historical success is due to the moral it integrity amongst each other and they talk about this they talk about the moral code this is the only reason these people were successful it's not their race um so it's about that it's about their moral code it's about their morality and their true heroic vision meaning true heroism and this this is like the knight templars the you know people who saw themselves as heroes fighting for a righteous cause that's what makes you successful. That's what makes you make great achievements and expand and get people to follow you. It's not their race. That, that, that Aryan doctrine has been twisted into an authoritarian doctrine, right? So essentially, that will conclude my whole thing about the second wave neo-Nazism. But um, let me just dot the I on this and talk about uh, something I saw today uh, actually a few hours ago uh, there are residents in Chicago in Chicago I'm from Chicago there are residents protesting the construction of a migrant shelter in Brighton Park right this is a southwest neighborhood of Chicago kind of industrial a lot of railroads a, a lot of open space and there's supposed to be a new migrant shelter and I saw the people protesting and this goes right along with what I'm saying in, in this episode, 
you got 12,000 migrants in the city um, uh, spread, uh, spread out into 25 shelters. And I talked in one of my previous episodes about the immigrants being placed in public view strategically, like on purpose. Now, the crisis of a large group of foreigners having a large group of people who aren't from here, that's easy bait to catch people into collectivist thinking. Whether it is far left to help the foreigners or far right to get rid of them entirely. Now, I'll rest restate my position on the migrant crisis. The only reason it's a crisis here is because the government has them in limbo. Right? If you're building tent cities to house a population, you force them into a stagnation in their lives because they can't move forward. Now, if you've got a stagnant foreign population, that creates enmity between them and the residents. The, the people and the migrants see them see each other as their enemies the enemies of each other that social friction becomes social fear and then that funnels people into supporting mass government action now in in the case that i'm talking about here in this episode it's the action of nationalistic purity get rid of the migrants take them somewhere else we need to stay the way we are that's what I'm talking about. And I say nationalistic purity and not really racial purity because one of the residents I heard speak uh, very passionately, he was actually Hispanic. In this neighborhood, you know, most of Chicago is really, these are Hispanic neighborhoods uh, on the outskirts of Chicago. And this, you know, this brings up the point, the second wave neo-Nazism will not be limited to the white race. It's not just white people. It's just, it'll just be somewhat of a hybrid between racism and nationalistic self-interest, right? Many people are pro-America and they think there's such a thing as the self-interest of a nation. There isn't. There is only individual self-interest. That's why it's called self-interest. It's interest in yourself as an individual and what's best for you. So don't get caught in supporting nationalism now another fallacy i hear is driving down the wages um, people are talking about how these migrants or immigrants in this case more immigrants are, are driving down the wages that they're doing work for cheap and then there's less work for them to do now i've experienced this um, actually currently like in the past month we've had uh, we've had some ukrainian immigrants come and i see them uh, they they took a job that we, we needed them to do uh, and they've done it very well and I'm sure they they did it for cheaper than um, some tile workers would have done who are living in this country, right? But see, that's not a bad thing. It, it actually does the opposite of inflation. You, you get good work done for a smaller cost, making a, a higher profit margin for the employer allowing him to expand and create more work i don't get why people don't get this the whole driving down the wages thing is really the wrong way to, it's already slave think right now the only one who suffers when cheaper wor workers do the same work for cheap is that working class middleman who has their work actually won from them by a more determined immigrant who can perform a similar level uh, who has a similar level of ability so yeah you suffer but what people miss is that this is no injustice uh, this is the economic natural economic punishment for remaining an unskilled laborer this is what it is we're supposed to aspire it's like the immigrants aspire to come here and fight we need to aspire to move up not up in the corporate ladder but to advance so that your job is not one that can easily be taken by somebody who's just willing to lay down more tiles than you. Now, if we're a free market country for real, if we're a free market people for real, we need to be a free market people for real and, and not complain to government that this is happening. Now, on the other hand, yes, they're bringing the, these people for for what they're, they're bringing them for no reason right so so they're creating this friction but you're begging government to solve the problem that they created is clearly not going to be in your favor right it's not going to be in your interest um, of course 
Now, is the standard of work generally dropping as a result of the immigrants doing work here in America? Yes, that's just the case. Things are more flimsy. Things are not operating as well because you've got people that aren't from this culture. They're not from this language, and they don't respect. They don't respect um, the historical integrity that that founded this nation. But that's not the fault of the Ukrainian roofers, or the tile workers, or the Mexican painters and drywall guys, or the Arab truck drivers. It's the fault of the government's Hegelian attack on property owners of this country from the top and bottom of society. From the top is, is, is getting them into this corporate rat race and from the bottom they're replacing, they're taking their work with, with the immigrant workers. It's the government's fault. But you're aligning with government to get rid of the pressure that they have created. It's a losing battle. The answer is for us Americans or patriots or immigrants you know all of us who aspire to a life of prosperity and integrity we need to come together right under the right philosophy and ideas conducive to a moral civilization where the individual is his own decision maker an individual free to construct a family to own property and to do with it whatever he pleases that's what we need to unite under, not a race, not a country. That, those ideas. And ultimately, it's about the heroic vision of life. Seeing yourself as a hero on a journey of redemption in this world. To aspire to something, uh, to live according to principles. Principles like integrity, principles um, like, yeah. I'm talking about morality, right? Like we're talking about morality here objective morality which is essentially you know just don't be a piece of trash just don't take fr from anything don't take anything that you haven't earned right take everything that's yours and don't take anything that's not yours and take everything that's yours yeah the heroic vision of life which is essentially that uh, it's developing yourself it's completely looking at yourself looking at the truth looking at in the mirror working with the shadow self and also standing up for women and children, the key thing, the, the the essential thing that a hero does. This is what a hero does, right? He protects the innocent, he protects the women and children. So, you know, th this is what the uh, second wave neo-Nazis are going to miss. They're not going to be heroes. They're going to be criers and complainers, and they're going to be marching, and they're going to be blowing the trumpet, and they're going to be they're going to be sitting on the on the couch with their feet up watching the TV and, and supporting uh, extermination if it comes to that and he, and if they won't do it physically their mentality will will make them unwilling to really be heroic to the degree that we need to be heroic to battle back this coming tyranny system it's about the heroic vision it's about developing fully as the stellar man every man and woman is a star so that'll be it for this week in tyranny thank you very much uh, i hope you enjoyed and i'll see you next week on this week in tyranny